So, good morning, everybody. Um, so, welcome to this side event and our opportunity to present to you some of the output from our Infra AUV project. So, this is effectively our project workshop. Um, so, today we hope to uh, tell you about this project, how it came about, why it's important to the IMS, and we're going to report some of the achievements that have happened so far in the project. Um, so we have a large proportion of the project team here this week, so hopefully there'll be a chance to engage and have some discussions together, uh, both today and, and in the second half of this event tomorrow morning, uh, but also during the conference, if you spot any of us about. Um, we're, we're very happy to, to talk through some of the issues around measurement and metrology and calibration and so on. Um, so maybe some of you were at the panel discussion yesterday, um, so, so you would have heard at least some of the background to, to where we're coming from for, for, for this project. Okay, so... Sorry, see the slides are working. Not sure what happened there. <laughs> Perfect. But I can't. <laughs> okay, so if we cast our mind back three years ago, um, notwithstanding all of the things that happened in those three years, um, this first slide is kind of an illustration of the position uh, at that time. I'm just going to move this a bit so I can, excuse me. Um, so obviously acoustic and seismic monitoring are very key technologies in many geophysical applications, not least in the CTBT activities. But again, if we look back three years ago, um, or yeah, more than three years ago now, um, in the frequency range of interest in, in these IMS passbands, as they're known, um, there was little or no provision for measurement traceability uh, to enable the measurement data to be physically meaningful. Um, and, and we'll hear a bit more today about what traceability really means. Um, so while there were sensor calibration methods um, implemented in the laboratory and in the field, None of those at that time could be linked back to a primary standard because really there were no primary standards in existence. Um, and therefore the, the performance of the hydroacoustic um, sensors, the hyd uh, sorry, the infrasound sensors, hydroacoustic seismometers and so on, um, we also needed to, to characterize those for different environmental conditions because as you know in deployment, uh, there's a vast range of environmental conditions that these sensors need to work under and understanding how their performance changes under those environments was also a key aspect of, of the calibration challenge. Um, so, so therefore, um, it, it, this was around the time that the CTBTO were getting interested in metrology and calibration and fostering links with the metrology community and with the BIPM. We heard yesterday about the, the, um, the formal arrangements now that they have with the BIPM. Um, and together with the drivers from, from the, the, the PTS, from the CTBTO, um, we, we put together a project proposal um, formulated around these needs that you can see here on this slide um, and, and came up with, well, the, first of all, the, the project was successfully reviewed and, and funded. Um, and th these were the objectives that we, we set out um, and, and are pursuing during the project. So first and foremost was to develop the, the primary and secondary calibration methods for the low frequency range for these different sorts of sensors. Um, the next task is how to transfer that capability from the laboratory to the field. Um, so needing some kind of transfer device to move that traceability uh, into the field. So what were the devices that were needed? What were their performance requirements and so on? Um, so, so this really, uh, we'll, we'll come on to how the workshop is formatted, but these transfer standards are basically the link between today's topic and, and tomorrow morning's topic. Um, and then the next step in there is to develop methods for doing calibration on site. So how do we use those calibrated devices uh, to calibrate the live sensors that are in the monitoring stations themselves? And, and we'll look at some of the developments that we've come and, and implemented in the project around on site calibration. Um, and then um, after all of that, what we really need to do is show what the impact of introducing these metrology considerations are. Um, so what are the benefits to the IMS and, and for other monitoring activities with, with uh, seismic and acoustic sensors? Um, so so th this, this will all be documented in, in time to come. 
Um, and then finally, in the project, they're very keen, um, for the people that fund this project, they're very keen on stakeholder engagement and dissemination and so on. They want the, the fruits of the research to be taken to the user community and that the user community to really understand what's happened and, and to take up those outputs uh, as best they can. Um, so really, the, the events today and tomorrow are part of that dissemination process. It's a chance for us to tell you what's been developed um, and how that might be utilized in field measurement. So we're trying to engage particularly with station operators and other users of the scientific data, but also with the sensor manufacturers because they have a strong role in uh, this traceability provision. Um, and, and also with the standardization committee, so with the IEC and the ISO particularly to, to document some of these calibration methods. Um, and, and there might be a discussion to be had actually about the role of these international standardization committees um, in, in documenting the, the processes and procedures that are used in, in seismic monitoring uh, and, and infrasound and so on. Okay, so we, we got the project off the ground, we got it funded, um, and we actually put together a, a fairly unique consortium, unique in terms of these metrology projects actually. Um, so our consortium includes um, naturally the, these national measurement institutes that are the guardians of the, the primary standards and so on, and they're the ones responsible for developing and producing the primary standards and then delivering calibrations with, with those. Um, so, so naturally those people were involved. Um, but we also got uh, some involvement of uh, institutes that operate um, IMS stations. We have the BGR and the CEA in the consortium working together with the metrology community to make sure that the outputs that the metrology people are developing are fit for purpose for use in the field um, to support the, the kind of measurements that need to be supported in the IMS and, and elsewhere. Um, and well, the scientific consultant is me, uh, so I'm managing stakeholder engagement. Hopefully my, my usefulness goes a little bit beyond that. Um, and, and then uh, this, this institute called PTB, which you heard about yesterday, this is the National Measurement Institute in Germany. Um, that They are coordinating the project. They, they were the, the lead on the bid and so on, um, so that they are the ones doing all the project management to make sure that the consortium works well together. Um, and I, I should say, this, this is a, a wonderful consortium to be part of. Uh, I think everybody coming from different perspectives is working together really well. Um, so so it, it's a real pleasure to work in this project, actually. It's one of the most interesting projects I think I've been involved in. Okay, just a, a brief look at um, how we've structured the workshop. Today we're going to focus on mostly laboratory calibration, uh, just to show you where these primary standards come from, how they've been implemented, how we can connect a measurement to some fundamental physical basis, um, and then how we move that through the, the chain getting towards the field calibration. And then tomorrow we'll have a real focus on field calibration, um, how, how those calibration capabilities actually can impact real world measurements. Um, and, and hopefully tomorrow if we can make the technology work, um, we'll, we'll have some live demonstrations of some software and so on to show some, some of the tools that are used in, in monitoring the calibration status of devices in the field. Okay, so this is our agenda for today. Um, shortly, um, Dr. Thomas Bruns will give an introduction to the, the SI system again and, and what traceability means and so on. Uh, and then we'll move through. We've got um, basically a, a topic from each technological area. So we've got the seismic world covered, the infrasound technology, and the hydroacoustic technology. We've got our specialist metrologists from those areas to talk about the, the calibration developments there. Um, and, and we'll basically have a, a block on primary calibration and a block on secondary calibration. Um, there'll be a break in between, a chance to have a discussion, maybe nip off and get a coffee. Um, and we, we did also hope to have some posters um, placed in the room. Unfortunately, th this is such a nice room, we can't actually pin anything to the wall. Yeah, so, so what we've had to do instead is just literally lay out the posters on tables. So unfortunately, it's not a very typical poster presentation format, but the posters are there. These are posters we've used at other conferences in the past. Um, so by all means, please um, have a look at the posters during, during the break times and maybe after the session. Um, and and the, the, the authors of those posters are typically around if you want to get into discussions with them. So, so that's the format for today. So um, at that point, I'm gonna hand over to our first um, speaker, Dr. Thomas Bruns, who's gonna introduce the um, SI system again um, and, and take us through that, thank you. Yeah, thank you for the introduction, Richard. Um, in addition to the posters, which are not for takeaway, I have to add that we have some of our newsletters that we published in the meantime of the run, running pro, uh, project. 
also on the back of the table. Okay, better? Okay, um, so we have some newsletters on the back for takeaway. Maybe not a sample for everyone, but uh, they are on the website as well. Um, can you change the presentation to this next one? With that said, um, in my first presentation, I would like, just like Richard mentioned, to give you um, a little bit more insight into the uh, operation of the international system of UNIT. And I guess I make you aware of a system that you are not aware of that, uh, yet that is uh, operating in, all, I think, in almost all countries by now. Um, and uh, I took as an example, of course, my, my own country um, um, with the national standards at, at PTB. And in most countries, you have a system for the distribution of the SI units or the national standards of, of measurement um, that is organized in this way. You have a National Metrology Institute at the top of the pyramid setting the national standards. Um, and then you have uh, calibrations done by this institute for industrial, typically industrial calibration laboratories that are under a surveillance system of the accreditation institution of that country. In some countries it's only one. In the EU it's by European regulation, it's only one by country. Um, in other countries uh, there are several accreditation um, systems in parallel. Um, but anyway, they are under quality ass uh, assessment uh, in a, on a regular basis, and that makes sure that they are measuring correctly. They are really assessors, typically from PTB in Germany, going into the labs and checking how they operate it and whether their equipment is calibrated and the procedures are correct and things like that. Um, and then we have working standards um, in calibration laboratories that are in the industry, in factories with automotive manufacturers, for example, or um, other equipment manufacturers. Um, and they calibrate based on references traceable to accredited laboratories. And you have a multiplication factor between all those levels. So in the end, um, you have, as I say here, really many, many millions of calibrations that are in the end, not all on, under quality surveillance, but they are all kind of traceable um, to the SI standard given by the national laboratory. And of course you have um, a reduction in complexity. If you look at the top level for voltage, for example, you have a Josephson junction working at uh, liquid helium at very low temperatures, very sophisticated technology to get the best accuracy. And in the end you have a multimeter in the hands of someone uh, at the production line checking voltages or currents. Um, uh, but still, it has a link to this Josephson junction uh, operated at the national level. Now, the question is, that's fine for one country, and that's uh, a, actually a little bit like it has been for centuries, because in, in the old times, you had the emperor with his uh, L, this is part of the arm that sets the length standard, and that's put as a copy on the market um, uh, and, and used for comparison. So this is very similar. What happens? Um, if you have two countries and you want to have an international system. Um, of course, you cannot say the one country gives the, the reference and the other country has to follow. They are all independent and, and have the same self-esteem. So what we have here is the BIPM that Takashi Usuda already introduced um, yesterday in the um, panel or in the pr presentation before the panel discussion. And for the acoustic, ultrasound or underwater acoustic and vibration, the AUV, we have the CCAUV, the consultative committee, that is actually kind of organizing the comparison of the systems of different nations. Yeah, so we have uh, all representatives in the CCAUV from, from the countries, like Stephen usually is at the meetings for the NPL for underwater acoustics, and I'm at the, uh, at the meeting um, representing vibration metrology from Germany and so forth. And we organize what we call um, key comparisons. And uh, there have been comparisons now already established under the uh, uh, 
umbrella of the CTBTO for some expert labs in infrasound, but I'm sure you are not all aware of that and how it works. So what we want to do is we want to compare the measurement systems of the different countries. And to do that in a, in a, a quantifiable way, um, we use a reference standard. Here I choose a seismometer. Actually, we did not do it with a seismometer by now. We, as Richard pointed out, we don't, didn't have the, um, the ability before we started with the project. So there has been no key comparison yet for this frequency range. But nevertheless, we use a reference sensor or two, and this is circulated uh, among different laboratories, and they all measure the same um, response function at the same frequencies. So they, <clears throat> they should come out with the same, same result. So for example, here I choose some countries just by randomly. Again, Germany measures, UK measures, the NIST, for example, measures in the US. Um, and they all provide their results to the so-called pilot laboratory. And they all provide what you see here in the formulas is an XI. The I stands for PTB, NPL, or NIST, or NMIJ, or whoever is taking part. And they provide their uncertainties, so how accurate they measure. And of course, if you measure more accurate, you should have a larger share of the mean value that is calculated, which is then the reference value. So there we calculate a, a weighted mean based on the uncertainties, um, and we calculate a combined uncertainty of this reference value. And based on this reference value, we can ma then make a comparison. Um, we look at the deviations of the laboratories from this reference value of each result, the XIs, um, how they deviate. Um, and we look at the uncertainties, but this uncertainty is not what is submitted to the, um, uh, to the comparison. This uncertainty here, the uncertainty bar, includes the uncertainty of the reference value to some extent. There's some formula behind that. It's detail that you don't need to know here. But what happens is that sometimes you have someone who is not covering the reference value with this uncertainty bar. And this, these are real values that I show you here, real res results from a comparison. Um, so this happens. Um, and what happens then? I mean, this is inconsistent. They are kind of not fitting for this result. This is a certain frequency of that comparison. They are not fitting um, in the international system of units. So there is, that is where the discussion starts. That has to be analyzed, what, uh, what happened there. And, and uh, th this is a typical situation where one laboratory is inconsistent. And typically, it's a problem in that laboratory, of course. The temperature was not stable enough, or the reference was not calibrated that they used, or something like, like that. But in the end, we come up with such results. And uh, hopefully, um, it's like in the first place here for PDB, we have small uncertainty, but still cover the reference value. Um, so we are consistent, and we can, with this result, submit the so-called CMCs, the calibration and measurement capabilities. And these are then officially accepted internationally, and they are laid, out, uh, laid down in, a key, in the key comparison database, which is publicly available, very much like your uh, data from some seismology station. You can look up the, um, these results in the key comparison database and see how precise an institute can measure a certain quantity. Um, but those are only a few laboratories of the world. So what happens to the other ones? You see here already uh, a large gap on the right side, right hand side of the, of the chart um, for European laboratories. And there we have a thing called linking. Then we make regional comparisons where some laboratories that have been in participating in the high-level comparison also take part in this regional comparison, the European comparison. And they make then the link um, for this region, for Euromed, for example. And by this pattern of operation, we can then compare more or less all European laboratories to all other global laboratories, either uh, having taken part in the CC comparison or in the, in the uh, regional comparison of, for example, ZIM or 
uh, the APMP, the Asian Australian uh, um, Metrology Organization, AFRIMETS or COMET, or we have now recently GolfMET um, for some Arabic states. So we have regional um, organizations that take care of the laboratories that could, cannot take part in the very high level comparisons. And by that, we distribute the units all over the world and harmonize the whole system. And I think that's important to understand when we talk about covering the CTBTO under the umbrella of the CIPM MRA. The CIPM MRA is the contract that says once you are consistent within the system, your measurement and calibration results have to be accepted globally by the signatories of this arrangement. So going back up the ladder, or down the ladder actually, to the national scale, um, we then have a harmonized national system that is consistent with hopefully all other international uh, systems. Um, and, and we are on, this, on the safe side. And this is where we now want to integrate actually the IMS. The idea is that in the end, for seismometers, infrasound uh, measurement system microphones or um, microbarometers, um, you can either go to your national lab or you can actually take a service from a calibration lab that's committed to this kind of service and have, your, uh, have a reference sensor calibrated. And with that, this reference sensor, you can then go into the field and calibrate your station or your setup that you have in field. Today, we will take care about the laboratory calibration, so the upper range of this pyramid. And tomorrow, we will look towards the transfer from the laboratory into the field. That's the idea for today. And that's what I had to say as an introduction to this system. I, I think it's helpful to make sense of all the rest of the uh, presentations today. Are there any questions? Yeah, actually, we, we had some close cooperation in, in the past years with the NIM, the National Institute of Metrology of China in Beijing. Um, and, uh, well, usually with us, they are quite reasonable. That doesn't mean that they are reasonable in all cases <laughs> with, with all other parties. Um, and they, they are signatories of the CIPM MRA, as much as I know. Um, however, that does also not mean that they have to accept all specifications or that they cannot set their own specs for any bits for manufacturers. So that does, just does mean that um, we have the CIPM MRA and then we have the ILAC, uh, ILAC MRA, which is the International Laboratory Accreditation Association. So um, based on the CIPM MRA, also uh, calibration certificates of accredited laboratories should be accepted mutually between countries as long as they are signatories to both arrangements. Um, but if you are not accredited or you have not your results based on accredited calibration, you are no longer covered by these arrangements. So that may be the problem. And, and the other thing is politics. No. Other questions? Yeah. There's a microphone. I noticed that the, the system that you're describing um, of cascading reference measurements sort of presumes that the, the fundamental measurement of a meter or a second or something like that <clears throat> is actually incredibly difficult to do. But what about the situation where um, there's a reference signal available like the acceleration due to gravity, which uh, varies very little at the Earth's surface? Um, and is actually available on site. Uh, you don't need you don't need liquid nitrogen, <laughs> or sorry, what is it, helium? 
Yeah, that's uh, that's something that um, also happens in, in several fields where you have actually at a accreditation laboratory or um, actually at, at the application side, you have something like um, the realization of the of the base unit at your fingertips. Um, that's fine from the standpoint of, of uncertainty and repeatability of, of your measurement. Um, the other more formal thing that you have to consider is that only the National Metrology Institutes are uh, available or entitled to take part in this harmonization process by key comparisons. So even if your commercial or university measurement may be more accurate or with a lower uncertainty um, than any National Metrology Institute, they set the limit for your formal uncertainty because only they can prove that your result is consistent with the international system. That's a little bit a problem if, if you have really precise measurements. You can always then argue in, in uh, papers also that, that you have this and this uncertainty due to this and this uh, uh, estimations. But in the end, if it comes boils down to formal uh, formalized proof, the, the national metrologist set, set the level, the limit. That's, uh, we had this discussion earlier, but that's the, the pay case. Thank you so much, Chris. Not sure if this microphone's working. Um, I, I think we probably need to move on with the agenda, but um, pl please do pick up this discussion again um, during the breaks and so on um, with, with, with any of us around. So that'll be really interesting. Okay, so the next speaker then is going to be um, Dominique Rodriguez from the LNE in France. Um, and our focus now is infrasound. Um, and this is quite an interesting area, as we'll see, there are many options for realizing primary standards for infrasound, and, and Dominique will talk about those. Thank you very much, Richard, for the introduction. So, uh, waiting for the slides. So, okay, so thank you very much. So, uh, I have the honor to, to present here for my colleagues from the Auvergne NMIs. The part of the project dedicated to the development of uh, methods for primary uh, calibration of uh, microphones and uh, microbarometers at low frequencies. So this um, part of the project takes place uh, in the context of the metrological traceability as presented just before uh, and defined as a documented unbroken chain of calibrations from the definition itself of the unit on the SI system up to the uh, measurement equipment used by the final user. So here, we are concerned by uh, the first link between the definition of uh, the unit for infrasound measurements in the ASI system, so the acoustic Pascal, and its first realization, which is usually the responsibility of uh, an NMI, a National Metrology Institute. And so to do that, we use the primary method, um, method of measurement. So, yeah. So, what about the state of the heart on uh, infrasound measurements and metrological traceability? So, nowadays, uh, for conventional acoustic measurements, the primary reference uh, standard is established by the reciprocity method, so it is a very well established method and standardized. And in terms of uh, capabilities, uh, for the metrological traceability, as I said just before also, the, the, the capabilities um, or in terms of metrological traceability are materialized in the database, the key comparison database maintained by the BAPM, in which we can find the best uh, calibration and measurement uh, capabilities for all the NMIs in the world for a specific field. So for the specific field of sound pressure, as you can see here, we have, uh, we can find CMCs for acoustic measurements at frequencies down to two hertz. We can find also CMCs at static pressures, but nothing between these two limits. So this is the rationale of this uh, part of the project. And uh, uh, there is a need for a primary uh, reference standard for this uh, frequency range, um, which is um, very important for the EMS measurements. Okay, so the project structure and objectives were already presented. So the 
project is divided into five uh, work packages, and this part of the project takes place in the work package one, and more specifically in task 1.1, dedicated to the development of uh, new facilities and methods for uh, primary calibration of infrared sensors. So, uh, the first method I will present, so, we, sorry, we develop, I, I forget to, to say something. Yeah. Um, can I come back? Okay, fine. Yeah, I'm sorry. So we developed five independent methods in, in this project, developed by PTB, DFM, HBK, LUCNAM, and LNE. Okay, so the first, pro, uh, um, uh, the first uh, method I will present is the extension of the reciprocity method. Uh, HBK from the Denmark was in charge of this um, development. Um, so the, the reciprocity calibration is a well-established method, as I said uh, just before, it is a standardized, and it requires uh, reciprocal microphones to work and at least uh, one coupling cavity. So it relies on the calculation of the quantity we name the acoustical transfer admittance, and it's important to note that uh, these calculations of these uh, quantities were uh, recently improved, uh, specifically to, to extend the method to low frequencies. So the method is validated, is strongly validated by many international comparisons now down to two hertz, and here's a challenge in lowering the low frequency limit, or mainly to manage the leakages between the microphone and the coupling uh, cavity. So of course we could uh, seal completely uh, the system, but this uh, provides some unstable measurements. So here HBK tried to solve the issue by developing new prototype couplers, mainly by uh, sealing, by managing the sealing between the microphones and the, and the coupler, and also by the, the pressure equalization uh, was established by um, using a narrow, uh, a cut narrow slit, narrow enough in order to minimize its, its impact in the acoustical transfer um, uh, admittance, even if it, if it is corrected in the model. So you can see here some, um, yeah. Uh, some examples of calibrations obtained by the, with this new prototype coupler. Uh, the upper graph shows the sensitivity level and the fuzz for a, a microphone, the same microphone uh, measured um, four, uh, five times, sorry, over a period of four times over a period of five months. And the uh, lower graph shows the same results uh, relative to the average of four reciprocity calibration results. So, uh, as you can see in this result, the reproductibility is good. We have uh, standard deviations lower than uh, 0.01 dB in a wide frequency range, uh, growing up to 0.04 dB at lower frequencies. So it's very, very, very good. And it's satisfactory from, um, from 25 millihertz. Also, the results are consistent with uh, another calibration method, which is the electrostatic um, actuator. So these results are encouraging, and, and we expect uh, maybe in the very shortly uh, more formal uh, validation by, by, um, with uh, an intercomparison exercise, sorry. The second method is a carousel developed by PTB in Germany. So here we use the vertical gradient of the ambient pressure as a stimulus. So here's a the microphone is subject to an alternating pressure by periodically changing its altitude. The amplitude of the sound pressure stimulus uh, depends only on three quantities according to this uh, very simple formula, the air density, the gravity, and the altitude uh, change. So the altitude change is defined by the measurement system, the gravity is known and measured by PTB, and the air density uh, comes from a, a model uh, provided by the CAPM. So, um, so the microphone is mounted uh, on a vertically uh, rotating disc. This is why uh, PTB named this method the carousel. And when we apply a constant rotating speed to this disc, it produced a sinusoidal uh, sound pressure excitation. 
The working frequency range is from 0.1 Hz up to 5 Hz, but uh, PTB have plans to extend the method up to 10 Hz. So you can see here in this graph an example of calibration obtained with the carousel. It is a calibration of a microphone uh, in comparison to the, the same uh, calibration of the same microphone, sorry, calibrated by the laser piston fund is the next method I will present it just after. Uh, so as you can see, the results are in good agreement, validating here the, the results of the carousel in comparison to the laser piston fan. So the uncertainties claims are below 0.07 dB, so it's very good. And for this method, there is two challenges. At low frequencies, the poor signal to noise ratio because it's a free field calibration, so uh, we are the, the, the issue is the background noise, so it's difficult to isolate the system from this ba background noise. And at high frequencies, there is some issues also of wind-induced noise <coughs> given the, the speed of the rotating disk. Okay, the third method is the laser piston fan developed at LNE in France. So here the infrared sensor to be calibrated is exposed to a calculable sound pressure uh, produced in a coupler. And so this sound pressure is calculated as a product of two quantities, the acoustic um, impedance of the coupler and the volume velocity of the piston. So the acoustic impedance comes from a modeling. It is calculated by using a modeling and standard Z. And the volume velocity of the piston is measured by using uh, an interferometer and by considering the piston as perfectly rigid. So you can see here some examples of calibration with the system. One of the interests of the system is that it is suitable for a large variety of sensors, microphones, of course, uh, static pressure sensors like barometers, manometers, and also microbarometers. So this is interesting, but what about the validity of this metrological um, data? So special attention here was paid to uh, validate the metrological performance of this system. And to do that, we make some comparisons with other validated and independent methods, but because there is not a, a unique method valid for the full frequency range of interest, we consider here two different methods. For the high frequencies, we calibrated a microphone uh, with the laser piston fan and by reciprocity uh, technique, uh, trace up to the size from 2 Hz up to 20 Hz. So these are the blue data. Uh, and uh, we used also a manometer calibrated at DC, trace up to the size at DC, and um, the to account that uh, this manometer is able to, to measure with the same sensitivity um, the inflation pressures up to a fraction of hertz. So these are the black data. So as you can see here, the results provided by the laser piston phone are in good agreement with the reference data in the frequency range where the reference data are considered as valid. So this validates uh, the metrological performance of the system. Here the uncertainties claimed are the best of one or around 0.03 dB at one hertz. The next method is a manometric method developed by DFM in Denmark. So here uh, the manometric method uses the very classical um, principle of the YouTube manometer. So the pressure to be measured is applied to one side of the tube producing a movement of liquid in the tube. Here the shaker will produce the sound pressure inside the cavity. And the applied sound pressure can be calculated by using this very simple formula also, involving the density of the fluid, the gravity, and the water column height. So here we have to measure this water column height. Just on the right, uh, the specific realization of the YouTube manometer at DFM, and just below, uh, uh, first, uh, the first um, results obtained with the system, so the response of the YouTube manometer, the blue curve, in comparison to the theoretical response, the expected one, the, the red one. So as you can see, it fits only at lower frequencies. There is a resonance effect here that is not taken into account in the expected response. So what's happened? The, um, this theory, as presented here, is valid for um, uh, a static pressure sensor, and in reality, the, the couplet system is rather a dynamic system. So, DFM works on improving the theoretical response with 
this new formula. And as you can see here in the new results, it's worked better. The theoretical response and the measuring one fits better, but it's not enough, unfortunately, for a primary calibration system. So DFM is still working on improving the system with a smaller acoustic uh, cavity and trying also to solve some, uh, some issues. Uh, improve the measurement of the water column height uh, to try to isolate better the low frequency background noise for of noise and vibration and also uh, try to manage better the, the leakages. The last method is a refractometry technique using a fabri perot cavity developed at Lucknam in France. Um, <coughs> so this is a fully optical method. A fabri perot interferometer used a, a, an optical cavity with a parallel reflecting surfaces, so mirrors, and only the light with a wavelength in resonance uh, can pass through this cavity. So the optical wavelength is also a well-known function of the refract uh, refractive index, which in turn is a, a function of the temperature and pressure, sound pressure. So here, by measuring the refractive index and the temperature, it's possible with the with revised lens formula to uh, deduce the sound pressure inside the fabric perot cavity. Here, the first results obtained with this system. So the sound pressure inside the fabri perot cavity as measured by the refractometer, the blue curve, in comparison to the sound pressure measured in the cavity by a calibrated microphone and a calibrated barometer. So as you can see also here, um, the results fit only at lower frequency, very low frequencies, very significant deviations. So um, it's interesting because this is a demonstration that uh, we can use a fabri perot uh, refractometer to measure some pressure, which is the first time we see that, but it's not enough for a primary calibration system. So Lucknam is still working also to improve um, this. A part of these deviations are now, now, are now understood. It comes from uh, the heat conduction effects inside the fabric or cavity, so it could be corrected. But it re remains also, we, we need, sorry, uh, also uh, a new uh, fabric or cavity to, to minimize this effect. So Lucknam is still working on the method. So as a conclusion, we have five independent, we developed five independent methods with different respective benefits. The reciprocity method is a well-established method, standardized. It produced a, a high accuracy level, uh, but it is suited for LS microphones, at least in the form presented here, it is suited for LS microphones. Uh, for the moment, it is validated to, uh, down to two hertz, but we expect um, shortly uh, validations at lower frequencies. The carousel is uh, conceptually simple. It is suitable for microphones. We have two, there is two issues with the, this method. It's a poor signal to noise ratio at very low frequencies and the control of airflow noise at high frequencies. The system was validated uh, in comparison to the laser piston phone with a, a publication in, in Metrologia. The laser piston phone um, um, is suitable for a large variety of sensors. This is the interest of the system. Uh, it is uh, validated, it was validated also, the metrological performance was validated and, and published. The manometric method uh, is conceptually simple. It is suitable for a large variety of sensors, but unfortunately for the moment, uh, the demonstrated accuracy is not sufficient, so further works are agreed. Like the refractometry method, it could be um, it could be suitable for a large variety of sensors, but for the moment, the, the accuracy is not sufficient for a primary calibration system. Okay, so as a conclusion, this uh, project was very exciting because to my knowledge, it's the first time we had five independent methods to analyze and to, to develop. So, and of course, having so much uh, methods um, is uh, of interest for, for many reasons, but Regarding the first objective of providing the, the, the first link in the metrological traceability chain for the full frequency range of interest of, uh, of the infrasound measurements for the EMS, 
This task is done now, at least for some methods. It, will, it was be demonstrated the metrological performance for the carousel and the laser pistophone were already uh, demonstrated, demonstrated in uh, reviewed papers, but we expect uh, uh, shortly uh, more validations, specifically for the reciprocity calibration method, uh, because we are participating to an intercomparison exercise with the in, uh, reciprocity carousel and the laser piston front. So, so we expect uh, shortly new, new uh, validation um, results. We expect also uh, threshold calibration services by the SNMIs and also new standards to um, provide uh, international recognition of these new methods. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dominique. Um, we have time for very one brief question, um, if there are any. Otherwise, we'll go directly to the next um, presentation, which we, we change our medium now. So we're still talking about infrasound, but in the ocean or in, in water. So can I invite Steve Robinson, please, to, to take the stand and uh, present on the hydroacoustics field? Do I take an oath if I take the stand? Yes, OK. Um, OK. Um, uh, um, Yes, yeah, so the next talk we have this morning is on um, measurement standards for hydroacoustics. Um, so I've act I should actually um, thank Dominic. I did steal one or two of his slides and, and overwrite them with different words to represent the hydroacoustic field rather than the, um, the infrasound field. So this is a similar slide to what you've seen before. Um, just to illustrate that we're going to concentrate here on the primary calibration aspects. So here we're talking about the most accurate way we can realize the acoustic units, in this case, the acoustic pascal, if you like. Um, and the task it refer, it, it, um, that covers this in the, in the project is this task 1.3, as you can see down there. Um, and again, just to illustrate, this is the, in terms of the, the dissemination chain um, that we had described earlier by Thomas, this, this refers mainly to the, the calibration done by National Metrology Institutes at the sort of top of that pyramid we saw earlier. So um, this is um, an illustration of the sort of frequency ranges that we have for hydroacoustics. Now, um, uh, I would say that probably in hydroacoustics, um, or underwater acoustics as we normally call it, um, we're slightly behind um, in terms of the metrology infrastructure. Um, compared to vibration and um, uh, and, uh, and airborne sound, um, in most of those cases, they've had um, CMCs, as we call them, which are declarations by the NMIs of their best measurement capabilities that cover the most of the frequency range. And we've had key comparisons. This is this, is this uh, intercomparison exercise that um, takes place. Um, between the NMIs to validate their standards and to, uh, to compare them to make sure that there's mutual equivalence between them um, in mo for most of the frequency range, whereas in underwater acoustics, you've really only had that for what we call free field calibrations that take place um, in tanks of water or large volumes of water. And that goes from 250 hertz upwards in frequency to 500 kilohertz. But over this low frequency range, um, which is the range that's most interesting to the IMS, um, there's actually been no key comparisons at all. So the NMIs of the world haven't actually intercompared their realizations of the primary acoustic units. Um, partly that's because um, there are so few realizations around the world of these primary calibrations. So in fact, if I counted them, there'd be four, the USA, UK, China and Russia are the only four who really have um, primary realizations uh, uh, for underwater acoustics down at these low frequency ranges. Um, and um, the previous attempt we had a few years ago now to get a key comparison started was stymied a little bit by the fact that some of those um, primary standards were in a state of disrepair. So the, the one in the UK was being refurbished and rebuilt, as was the one in the USA. Um, and so consequently, we didn't have enough participants to take part in a key comparison. So one of the objectives of this um, exercise is to um, if it really catch up with the low frequency primary um, capabilities for some of these NMIs, especially in Europe. 
Um, the, um, the, there are a number of different primary methods. I'm only going to describe two of them here. Um, but they are the two that are probably the most accurate and the most um, suitable for uh, realizing a primary standard. Um, the other thing I would say, finally, is that um, this particular frequency range, um, uh, I'm going up to 100 hertz here, but say up to 250 hertz, is of interest to the IMS and to the CTPTO for its own particular applications. It's also interesting for um, uh, ocean uh, monitoring systems, looking at tsunami monitoring and earthquake monitoring and so on. But it's not the only reason for monitoring that sound in the ocean at these frequencies. In fact, noise pollution monitoring is one of the most, um, the, the biggest drivers for measuring sound in the ocean. And the noise sources of largest concern are those at lowest frequency where the sound footprint, if you like, travels over a much greater distance, where the sound in the ocean travels over great distances without much attenuation. So, so, uh, and many of the species of most concern um, have hearing at these frequencies, and the sources of greatest concern, the loudest, most energetic sources, if you like, in the ocean that man um, uses, things like um, uh, geophysical sources or seismic sources for uh, oil and gas prospecting and so forth, um, explosions, decommissioning, and, and also construction for things like wind farms. They also generate most of their energy at these frequencies. So there's a so there's a, a, certainly a need for having um, standards at these frequencies um, to at least improve what we got at the moment. So moving on to the methods, both of these methods have already been described by, um, by Dominic, but we realize them in a slightly different way in underwater acoustics. This first one is hydrophone calibration by what's sometimes called a calculable piston phone. So here you're driving a chamber uh, with a piston and you're, it's filled with air, and you're calculating the, um, uh, the pressure change in that, in that um, chamber um, through knowledge of the gas laws, knowledge of the, of the, the compliance of this medium, um, but also knowledge of the motion of the piston that you're driving it with. So the volume change is measured by measuring the piston displacement, which is measured using a, a laser interferometer. In our case here in this project, we developed one with a, a piezo stack driver. Um, uh, and the system can provide phase as well as magnitude. And it's, as I said, you, uh, as Dominic explained, it's been used in air acoustics for microphones, though this is the first time that we're aware of it being used for hydrophones. And the range we're using it over is half a hertz. Up to 100 hertz is, is the aim in the project, though we hope to go a little bit higher. And you can see a few pictures of it there. Um, one of the things to point out with these calibration systems for low frequencies is that you normally want something called the free field calibration of the hydrophone. It, it's, cal it's sensitivity to an acoustic wave from a given direction uh, in, in a medium. Um, when you get down to these low frequencies, it's harder and harder to achieve um, these free field conditions. You need larger and larger volumes of water. So what we tend to do is go towards what we call pressure calibration. So we do the calibrations inside small chambers where the wavelength of the sound is much greater than the size of the chamber. And essentially the, the pressure inside is uniform. So really you don't have any sound waves in there at all. Hydrophones respond to pressure and you're just varying the pressure in the chamber by driving it with some kind of um, uh, driver, in this case a piston. So the results that we've had for this are very encouraging. So these just show the results for, with, with the uncertainties for the piston phone going down to um, half a hertz. Um, one of the problems we have with this is that these hydrophones are very difficult to measure um, when you get to these very low frequencies if they have no electronic um, preamplification. Or here we're using a hydrophone that's essentially a piezoelectric um, device with no preamplifier associated with it. So it ought to be flat down to below 1.1 hertz in its sensitivity, and we've got reasonably flat results there down to half a hertz. Um, but we had to take special care at, in measuring the voltage that comes out of it to avoid electrical loading by the instrumentation. Um, and as you can see, this is a, a, the results of one particular hydrophone made by a, a Danish manufacturer, Bruin Care. Um, we've also compared this to um, other, other um, methods, including Dominic's um, 
uh, laser piston phones, LNE. Well, I haven't got the results to show here. They're just hot off the press, but the results are quite encouraging that we seem to get quite good agreement, so we're quite pleased with that. Um, this method of our own here, uh, we've implemented MPL, also, also allows you to calibrate a microphone, so you can do that in comparison uh, quite neatly. The results at the high frequencies there, um, as we get uh, uh, above 100 hertz, show some variation, and that's due to the fact that you start to get non-uniform pressure inside the chamber. So um, what we're going to try and do is correct for that by a bit of modeling of the pressure inside the chamber, but we can already reach the 100 hertz limit that we were aiming for in the project um, without worrying about that too much. The other method is this coupler reciprocity method. Um, here, it's slightly different. Again, it's a classic method for calibrating hydrophones, slightly different implementation um, for underwater acoustics. Here, we have um, a water-filled chamber. Now, water filling has two advantages uh, compared to the air-filled chamber um, uh, I showed you for the laser piston phone. One is that the wavelength is much greater, so you can go to much higher frequencies. Here, you can normally reach a kilohertz with this method. Um, the trouble with it is that you then have a chamber which you need to know the acoustic impedance of. You need to know the compliance of this chamber. And water's just about incompressible. And so consequently, the, the chamber itself can't be regarded as rigid compared to the medium. And you need to know the compliance of that chamber. Uh, and that has to be calculated um, or, or measured. And the way, um, the way to limit the problem with this, especially when you introduce the third hydrophone labeled H in this, in this diagram here, is that, which is of unknown compliance, is to reference the measurements back to a reference implementation of this couple, which only has two reference transducers involved, the P and T, you can see here. This is sometimes called the reference transfer method of coupler reciprocity, which has been described in a number of papers um, and was first developed in the USA. Um, so the, the method implemented at MPL looks like this, uh, and you can see some results for measurements of different applied pressure. The other advantage of filling with water is you can actually um, apply a pressure to simulate depth. So every 10 meters depth in the ocean is equivalent to about another one atmosphere of pressure. So, and because hydrophones are not generally used at room temperature and at the surface of the ocean, they're generally used at depth then it's quite useful and, in fact, quite important to be able to pressurize and simulate that depth when you do the calibrations. And, and is, that, is that giving me 30 seconds to go? Is it, um, the, the, um, and, this, um, and this method allows that. And so you can see, there's a, uh, if you look at the pictures, there's a pressurization system uh, involved in, in, in the measurements as well. And you can see that the, the reference trenches, as I mentioned, are, are shown, these spherical trenches are shown in the, in the picture. One of the, pro the real problems we have with this method are that its repeatability at the moment is not good enough at the lowest frequencies. I would, I would probably argue, though I've yet to prove it, that this method is not quite as accurate as the laser piston phone at its, at its highest, um, at, its, at its most, um, if you like, at its best implementation, but gives you much more flexibility in that you can calibrate against uh, as a function of depth as well. Again, the very high electrical impedance of the transducers used sometimes gives us problems as well. We're filling it with water. Um, even though it's deionized, degassed water, it still has some electrical conductivity which causes us um, some problems at the lowest frequencies. So we coat these, trans these, these reference transducers in a coating which is non-conductive, but that still gives us problems. The American implementation of this uses castor oil, which is much less conductive, but has lots of other problems with trapping air and bubbles and so forth, which means that the compliance is very difficult to determine. Um, the idea here is we can pressurize up to the equivalent of 700 meters uh, depth. Our, our partner in the project in Turkey, who are not not here today, but they have also rep, um, implemented this method, and you can see some pictures there of their implementation of it. They have slightly different um, implementations of the reference trenches, you can see in the bottom right, but essentially the method is very similar. Uh, a small chamber filled with um, water again and pressurized um, uh, to enable you to simulate depth. Oh, so, so comparing the two methods, um, uh, you can go from a few hertz with a couple of reciprocity up to a few kilohertz, um, not so high with the laser piston phone. Uh, both of these are described in, in terms of the basis of the method in international standards. You can pressurize the couple of reciprocity method, which gives you the ability to simulate depth. Now, 
The weakness of both of these methods is that in order to be able to um, get the highest accuracy, you have to compromise flexibility. So they can only be used to calibrate specific types of hydrophone, which can fit into these very small couplers. So you need another method, which we'll come on to a little bit later in the morning, to um, disseminate the standards, if you like. So in other words, to transfer the primary standard you make here uh, to a, a standard or calibration technique that can be used for any device that might be used in the ocean to measure sound. Um, so there's always a limit on the, uh, um, the flexibility here. They can only be used to calibrate um, specific types of transducer. However, the laser piston phone has a bigger coupler and can probably accommodate a greater range of them, but it's still quite limited. Um, and with, I've yet to demonstrate this, but I believe that the laser piston phone probably will be a greater accuracy. The accuracy of the, will be the order of a few percent, and the uncertainty is slightly more for the coupler reciprocity, which is a slightly more um, complicated implementation um, to get right. And so that's probably the last uh, slide. Just to say the, uh, uh, just to summarize what I said earlier, that we've got at least two of these implementations. It's not the only way of absolutely calibrating a hydrophone. There are others, but we believe these are the two that have the most uh, potential for accuracy. Um, we're comparing the two. We haven't yet got results. The project finishes at the end of this year, and we'll have results showing the comparison between the different methods, um, leading, we hope, to a new key comparison starting uh, in a year's time or so um, under the auspices of the consultative committee, the CCAUV that um, Thomas mentioned earlier. So that will enable us to intercompare the calibrations of the laboratories around the world for the first time at this frequency range. Okay, that's my talk. Thank you very much, Steve. So, we are running a little behind schedule, but unless you have a, a burning question for Steve, um, perhaps we'll move directly on to the seismic calibration area, and any questions you do have will we'll be around. We're going to take a break after this presentation. Um, do, do, do come up and find us and, and have a chat about with your questions. That'd be great. Okay, uh, thank you, Thomas. Okay. Slides are coming. <laughs> okay, so finally, for the block of uh, primary uh, calibration methods, we are taking care of acceleration or velocity um, or the seismic uh, branch of uh, IMS measurements. Um, and my presentation is only covering one method because basically there is one method for primary vibration calibration. Um, and uh, it's slightly um, yeah, more on the principles than on our results in the, in the project. Um, so uh, if you want to calibrate a seismometer, yeah, okay, thank you. Um, if you want to calibrate a, a seismometer, you need basically three units um, for the sensitivity. You need volts, meters, and seconds, and uh, we have all, be, all the time being discussing about uh, the base units or the international system of units. So I want to explain you how those units come into play um, in our primary calibration systems. And only at the end of the talk, I will tell you what the primary calibration system looks like. Um, so this is from the point of view of our laboratory at PTB taking care of vibration calibration. Of course, we are, as a colleague said uh, earlier this morning, we are standing on the shoulders of giants, so we are also uh, depending on the work of others in the National Metrology Laboratories. For example, if we look for the second, I'm sure that most of you are aware that uh, the national, your national time scale is distributed based um, on something that is called an atomic clock. Um, and currently, um, the definition of the second is based on some transition in a cesium uh, atom. Um, and the most accurate clocks are so-called cesium atomic fountain clocks um, uh, compared to stove-driven clocks that were used earlier. And uh, as you see on the slide, you, you, they provide a relative standard deviation of 10 to minus 17 by now, which is, uh, I calculated that, one second in three billion years. So, they are 
beyond any question of accuracy for our implementation, especially at low frequencies. So, um, nevertheless, we, we rely on the colleagues in the uh, time and frequency department because they just distribute over our internal uh, optical fiber network, which is usually used for IT things. Um, they also distribute the 10 megahertz reference clock, reference to their atomic clocks, so extremely stable. Um, and if you look at vibration measurements, your time information is actually somehow hidden because you uh, implement it in terms of your sampling frequency. You have AD converters sampling any kind of signal or you have generators driving some signal and they are using sampling and the sample clock is what gives you the timing information. And here we just use this 10 megahertz reference clock to synchronize our measurement or generation systems. Or sometimes not, not actually to synchronize them online, but to calibrate them uh, periodically um, against such the, a reference clock. It depends on, on the needs of the system. So this is very simple for us. It's just a really plug and play. We just plug it into the fiber connector and we get the 10 megahertz. Um, a little bit more elaborate is the volt. Um, still here we are standing on the shoulder of giants, um, but it's also very simple. The colleagues from the electrical department, they are again standing on shoulders of giants for the atomic clocks because they use what I already introduced at the, at the, in the first presentation. They use something called Josephson junctions or more sophisticated Josephson arbitrary waveform generators which are available by now. The Josephson junction is a quantum mechanic microelectronic um, system or device where you uh, basically have a very special kind of antenna for uh, a signal in the several tens of gigahertz range, uh, electromagnetic wave. And when you put that wave into this device under very low temperature conditions, this Josephson junction gives you a certain voltage, and the voltage is directly in a quanti quanti quantized way um, related to the frequency. So if you change the frequency by frequency modulation, you also can change the voltage, and you can actually nowadays can generate arbitrary signals, that's what the arbitrary waveform generator says, arbitrary signals by uh, uh, pr using um, frequency modulated radio waves very high frequency radio waves, in fact, uh, together with this Josephson junction. So anyway, they produce in their facilities this extremely precise voltage relative standard deviations, if I found it correctly on our internal web, are in the order of 10 to minus eight or 10 to minus nine. Um, and they calibrate very sophisticated electronic multimeters for us. These are the transfer standards that we use. We have this, we call it always the holy grail HP 30, 458A. Um, we send it to them in a regular peri periodical fashion. They calibrate it, we get it back. And with this multimeter, we make a comparison calibration of our ADCs. And that's all. So in, in terms of, of voltage measurement, we are actually uh, very similar to uh, what I showed you in the first presentation, like in an industrial lab. We just get the uh, calibration, the traceability from our electrical department using a commercial voltmeter. Very precise voltmeter, but nevertheless a commercial voltmeter. Nothing magic about that. And with this, we calibrate our ADC cards, which are like here an 80-bit ADC um, data acquisition system. Um, um, and we get accuracies in the order of, of five times 10 to minus five relative standard deviation, um, which is fine for us actually, as I will show you in a minute. The most interesting unit for us actually is the meter um, because here um, we only, with one leg, let's say we stand on the shoulder of giants, with the other leg we have to be our own giant. We have to set up laser interferometers. There are several ways you can do that. I choose just one here uh, with a very basic principle. It's a Michelson interferometer. We, we use some interferometers that are slightly different. If you want to know the details, we can discuss it in the break. Um, so anyway, in a, in a size, uh, in a interferometer, you have a, a laser source with a focused laser beam. 
um, sent out and you send it through a beam splitter. So you split the same beam in half and you probably know that for a laser, you have a very well-defined wavelength and you have a very coherent uh, signal. That is that um, a track of light waves is quite long and, and consistent over, the, over this length. So um, if you send this uh, two parts of the beams um, to a fixed mirror and to a moving mirror, um, the moving mirror is in the end is our shaker that we want to measure, whether we want to measure a position or a change in position. Um, then you get the reflection um, and this reflection of the both beams will be overlaid on the photodiode, on the detector that you have in that interferometer. And uh, if you look at the signal um, of that detector, um, here you have the, uh, the violet and, and the green um, reflection. And if they are arriving um, in line, so with the same phase, with the same uh, maximum and minimum of the electromagnetic field on the photodetector, they amplify or they add up. You have a, the, the detector in bright light, you may say. So now if you shift the moving mirror a little bit, here I took one-eighth uh, of the wavelengths, and the wavelength is for helium neon, it's 600 33 um, nanometers. Um, if you uh, shift it by half of that sinusoidal period of the electromagnetic field, they are no longer maximum to maximum, but they are maximum to zero. So they are no, no, no longer really adding up. You get less light on the photodetector. And if you shift the moving mirror a little bit further, you come to a position where they are maximum to minimum in the electromagnetic wave position. So you get Actually, you don't really get darkness, but you get a minimum in the light. Even under optimum conditions, you still have some light there due to energy, uh, um, what's it called? The preservance of, of energy. Um, so, but nevertheless, when you move uh, the mirror or the, your, your moving part of your system, you get a light dark change on your photodiode. And with this, you have actually a scale and you can also interpolate um, or identify positions in between so you are not limited with current interferometric methods to those positions lambda eights or lambda fourth you have uh, uh, up to a thousands and more of uh, intermediate positions that you can identify and with that um, you actually can uh, trace back your change in position of this moving mirror um, to the wavelengths of the laser. And this is uh, the setup we actually use then. We have uh, on, the, um, on the left um, the interferometer. I printed here a green, <laughs> green laser beam because uh, this is actually an infrared uh, laser interferometer. So if you come to our laboratory and look at the measuring beam, you don't see anything. It's invisible, it's infrared. Um, but it has a green uh, pilot beam so that as a human you can still do the focusing and, and <laughs> adjustment of, of the beam. Um, usually you use helium neon lasers because for helium neon lasers um, there is, ha have been a lot of investigations and if you use them in mono mode and in, with a red transition, um, you know if the laser works, it has a certain wavelength of 633 point something um, accurately to, 10 to about 10 to minus 6. It's a kind of a natural constant of length measure, measurement that is used in many laboratory applications where you, where you need less accuracy than 10 to minus 6 uh, for the length measurement. And you just need a helium neon laser. And if, it, if it's a light, if it's red, it's good. Um, here, for some other reasons I don't want to discuss here, we uh, implemented an infrared laser and we actually have a wave meter uh, that can measure the wavelengths of this instrument um, for us. So now for the analysis part, um, as I said, we have, we have the motion of this shaker. We measure it with the laser interferometer, just like explained before. Um, and we use typically 
si single sign or multi sign, where multi means uh, two or up to four frequencies, um, excitation. So the table is not moving uh, by random noise or something. So we have very precisely known frequency that is drive uh, that are driving um, this shake table. Then we typically use heterodyne interferometers. As I said, they are a little bit more complicated than this Michelson interferometer, but nevertheless, the basic principle is the same. Um, and we use something that is called digital arcus tangens demodulation. That also doesn't really matter for, for the uh, implementation basics. Um, then in the end, when we have analyzed the interferometer, we have a sinusoidal signal of lengths. Um, and if we then analyze or, or look at the voltage measurement that we do synchronize to the length measurement in parallel at the same time, the same sampling rate usually, um, we have a sinusoidal voltage. Um, and then we do what we call sign approximation. That is the formula you see there for, uh, uh, well, you can, yeah, for velocity, for uh, example, or for the voltage which is A times sinus omega t, where omega is the excitation frequency, plus B, cosinus omega t, plus C. Sometimes you have, for some reasons, an offset in, your, in some of your signals. Um, we do the approximation, and then you can uh, calculate the um, amplitude just by um, adding up the squares and taking the square root of A and B of the coefficients, and the phase, the initial position of your sine wave when you start the measurement by the arcus tangens uh, of the ratio of the two coefficients. And with that, we can easily calculate the magnitude of the sensitivity voltage divided by velocity. And the nice thing about sinusoidal excitation is that the velocity is omega times the displacement. So you don't need to make a numerical differentiation of your signal, um, which adds a lot of noise you can just fit your sinusoidal curve to the displacement with low noise and multiply by omega, and then you have the velocity. Of course, it's I omega. It's a complex multiplication because you also have a phase shift if you go to velocity. And then we can calculate magnitude, and you can calculate phase as the difference of the initial phases. And the phase, as, in, as it's the time delay of the signal coming in and the voltage coming out, is important if you want to do distance calculations or back azimuth calculations as far as I understand. So uh, as a final view on the thing, measurement uncertainty. Um, measurement uncertainty is, of course, very important for metrology and it's something that we want also to disseminate into the IMS line of thinking. I already indicated that the electrical uncertainty is uh, for us about 10 to minus 4. That's uh, pretty nice, and we, if, if we do our regular calibrations of the electrical systems, there's not much to really care about in the end. Um, then the time and sampling uncertainty is 10 to minus 8, typically. If you have good, a good oscillator in your, in your system or you are really connected to the reference 10 megahertz, no question about that. The wavelength uncertainty um, is uh, far lower than uh, 10 to minus 4. Um, and what really bothers us in the end is the mechanics. So our basic measurement systems, the units that come to our lab are not the problem. It's actually the mechanics, the geometry. Um, for the seismometers, we are really um, bothered with the tilt issue. If you have, uh, uh, during the motion, you have a tilt of the seismometer at the very low frequency. Um, you get uh, changing gravimetric influences, which uh, make phase um, velocity uh, signals. Um, the orientation of the sensor, the, you, you know, northeast or the, the x-axis in the direction of motion to get this aligned, it's not very simple. Um, ambient vibrations, this is one of the reasons why we use single sign or uh, only a few multi-signs for the excitation. If you look at very specific frequencies, um, you can ignore most of your ambient vibrations because you know where you're looking at. And ambient vibration, if you're not just hitting one of those modes of your room or of your building, you usually uh, have a very small influence in, at this single frequency. 
Then you have mounting conditions. I discussed that yesterday already with some persons. <laughs> um, you, you have to be careful um, on, on what material you mount your transducer or and at what conditions. You have this adjustable uh, feed at the seismometers and, and you have to make them as short as possible um, to have an, as stiff mounting as possible. But that may then change to the application we, we have to see. Relative motion, of course the mirror has to represent the motion of your shaker. There should not be a, a relative motion between the shaker and, uh, and the mirror. And there should not be a relative motion between at least the feet um, of your seismometer and your moving part of the, of the shaker. And there is sometimes. And uh, I always say, well, it's, that's beyond the frequency range of the IMS, but I always say, starting from five kilohertz, any material you put on your shaker is a putting. It's, it's all wobbling, and the higher you get in frequency, the more wobble you have. But you, if you go lower to, in frequency, it's just the more accurate you look at it, the more wobble you have. So even at low frequencies, you have relative motions. You just have to look precisely enough. You will see them in the end. So that's it, it basically. Um, for you to understand where this calibration comes from at the very beginning, that's the method of primary calibration, and that finish, finishes my presentation here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in which case, we can move on to the second part of the workshop this morning, which covers secondary calibration. Um, and again, we're going to start with um, infrasound and then move through hydroacoustics and seismic technologies. Okay, so I'd like to invite um, Marvin Rust from PTB. Um, he, he'll talk about the procedures we've set up for secondary calibration of infrasound sensors. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, as Richard was going to uh, just said, I'm going to talk about the secondary methods for microphone and microbarometer calibrations. Um, just a short motivation why we need this secondary calibration. Um, just a short comparison of the sensors we use in laboratory measurements for the primary calibration and for field use. So for laboratory, to my knowledge, all of the me methods presented by Dominique use some kind of microphones as sensors. Some of them even laboratory standard microphones as shown up there with a membrane open to air without any protection grid. Um, while in the field stations, uh, microbarometers are uh, deployed or you use sound level meters for environmental noise measurements. And they have been designed with very different goals in mind. For example, the laboratory microphones are designed for long-term stability. So they do not change sen sensitivity over years. And suitability for the primary calibration method, we will see an example of that uh, in the next slide. And they are used at controlled laboratory con climate conditions. They do not like too high humidity, for example, or too drastic temperature changes. Uh, while on the other hand, the field devices uh, have to be rugged. I have seen pictures of microbarometers covered in water and still working. This would not be the case with a primary reference microphone, and they are designed for rough climate conditions. So somehow we need to bridge this gap between our laboratory and the field use. And for example, uh, at the pressure reciprocity method, uh, Dominic showed as the first method, um, this one is at low frequencies, currently only apl applicable for one specialized type of microphone. And um, the equalization went, which uh, uh, is used to equalize the back cavity of the microphone within pressure to the ambient air pressure, is not subjected to the sound field, which makes a drastic difference in frequency response of this microphone, shown on the right. So you cannot uh, apply a microphone like this directly in the field. So the objective is, as I said, to transfer the calibration onto field devices. And the main method to do this is a comparison from a reference, from a primary standard to a field device or a transfer standard to use to transfer it out to the field. Um, to do this, you subject the reference and the device under test to an excitation signal, the sound pressure. This can be applied by a loudspeaker or by a piston or by any other me method. And you determine the amplitude of this sound pressure from the vo voltage you measure at the output of the reference 
and the non-sensitivity of the reference, which you got from the primary calibration. And with this knowledge, you then now have the device under test subjected to a characterized excitation signal. You measure the output voltage at the device under test, and from that you can um, determine the sensitivity of the device under test. There are two major methods for this comparison calibration, the simultaneous and sequential excitation. For simultaneous excitation, you would place the reference and the device under test directly next to each other, for example, in a closed chamber. We will see some setups doing exactly this later. And they are subjected to the stimulus, to the sound pressure, at the same time. You use a closed chamber, as already, I think, said by Stephen, because you, uh, otherwise you cannot re really reach the high sound pressures you would need for a good signal-to-noise ratio. Um, this is special for infrasound. And uh, one requisite here is that the sound field must be homogeneous. So the reference and the device under test, which are at different locations, are still subjected to the same sound pressure, to the same amplitude and phase. This is given when the chamber is small compared to the acoustical wavelength. So for infrasound, this usually is not a problem. So that's why this is the main method used for infrasound secondary calibration. Uh, just for completeness sake, you could also do a sequential excitation where you place the reference and the device under test at the same location one after the other, and you subject them to the stimulus one after the other. Here the requirement is that, of course, the excitation source must not change in level over time. So um, that places a little higher requirements on the, um, on the excitation source on the loudspeaker, for example. This is mainly used for airborne sound with shorter wavelength where you get the problem of the homogeneity of the sound field. So um, with this basis, um, let's look at some implementations of um, comparison calibration. Um, all of these are going to use uh, simultaneous excitation. For example, the laser pistophone already presented by Dominique can also be used for secondary calibration when you place a device under test and the reference both inside the chamber or couple a microbarometer to the chamber as shown in the picture. Um, it's a closed and sealed cavity with a piston as a sound generator and it can be used for calibration in the frequency range from 10 millihertz to 20 hertz with a working amplitude of up to 50 pascals, typically, typically around 10 pascals. As reference sensors, there are used microphones of tube Brühl and Kia, type 4193, and static pressure sensors from CETRA. And as a device under test, uh, this chamber can be used to calibrate microphones, microbarometers, manometers, or barometers, with very low uncertainties, as shown below. A similar calibration bench is, uh, placed at, has been developed at CEA. It's also a closed and sealed cavity with a piston phone like infrasound generator. It can work in a, higher, uh, in a bigger frequency range from 1 millihertz to 100 hertz, but it's connected to the SI to, via 10 millihertz to 20 hertz via a primary calibration, I guess, from the piston from then I'm, yeah, uh, as far as I know, with a working amplitude from 1 pascal to 30 pascal. And also, as a reference sensor, they use microphones, the same infrasound type 4193 and a barometer from Keller this time, and interferometers. Uh, one specialty of this device is that up to eight microbarometers can be calibrated at the same time, so it can be used to calibrate from one reference a lot of devices under test at the same time, thereby saving a lot of time in the calibration process. And another specialty is that the um, static pressure in the chamber can be varied to simulate different altitudes to calibrate the microbarometer exactly for the altitude it's going to be used later. Another method to implement this is the sound tube at PTB. It's a closed acrylic tube with a loudspeaker at the bottom at the sound source. Devices under test are placed near the top of the uh, chamber. The dimensions are chosen to, be, uh, to accommodate microbarometers and sound level meters so they can be mounted inside, fully inside the chamber. And the arrangement of loudspeaker at the bottom um, 
and devices and test and references at the top has been chosen because at the top the sound field is the most uh, doesn't uh, is the most homogeneous. This uh, chamber is not shielded as well as the previously shown setup, so its frequency range is only down to 0.5 hertz, but on the other hand up to 100 hertz, which is used for sound level meter calibration and type approval, with a working amplitude of typically two pascals. Here we also use different types of microphones as, uh, refer as reference sensors, the 4160s, which have been calibrated using the reciprocity method, or 4193, which have been cal calibrated in the microphone carousel or in the laser piston phone. As devices under test, we can accommodate microphones, microbarometers, and sound level meters with a little higher uncertainty of typically 0.2 dBs for microphones and 0.3 dBs for sound level meters. A very similar tube has also been built at DFM. It's also made out of acrylic glass, PMMA, with a little smaller internal diameter, uh, but otherwise very similar. With, uh, it seems to be a little bit more sealed against the environment because its frequency range goes down to 200 millihertz. And lastly, there's also a commercially available coupler which can be used to calibrate microphones down to, with a reproducibility down to 25 millihertz, but this one on, is only available for one inch and half inch microphones for the already mentioned types 4160 and 4193. The specialty here is that the vent, which I showed in the beginning, can be placed inside or outside the sound field to accommodate the respective calibration methods or intended usages. So with that, I already want to wrap up. Um, the primary calibration methods developed are usually limited in sensor selection and already have a few specialties around that. So the, the sensors used there are not directly suited for field use, so the secondary calibration is, is used to transfer them, to transfer the calibration on for, from a primary standard to field devices. This is always done using a comparison with two major principles, and use mainly simultaneous excitation and closed cavity for um, airborne infrasound. And there are already multiple calibration setups realized. And with this, I want to conclude my talk. Uh, and what we can do with the sensors we calibrated will be part of tomorrow's topic on on-site calibration. Thank you very much, Martin. Oops, already done. <laughs> so hopefully you can see how we're making a progression now from these fairly esoteric primary calibration methods sometimes towards more practical calibration and, and moving now towards field calibration, which we'll cover tomorrow. Um, are there any quick questions for Marvin? If not, then we can change our technology again to underwater acoustic hydroacoustics and invite again Stephen Robinson um, to talk about the secondary methods in this medium. Uh, hello again. So uh, we're moving now to underwater acoustics, hydroacoustics. Um, same pictures before. Now we're concentrating on this secondary calibration issue, um, as mentioned by Richard and Marvin. And again, so this moves down the chain, traceability chain from the primary realization to the uh, calibrations that are used in laboratories out there in the real world, where um, a user might send their hydrophone for calibration. Uh, I'll skip through that. I've mentioned it already. So. Um, Marvin's done a very good job already of describing the principles that are used for these calibrations. In particular, the idea of just doing a comparison between a reference calibration, a reference hydrophone already calibrated uh, by a primary method, and comparing the results for that, the data for that, f well, with an unknown device, a device under test, simply by insonifying both of them simultaneously and comparing the, the voltages of the two devices. Now. Um, uh, this is done typically um, using a closed coupler, and uh, you can see examples of implementations of that here. They can either be filled with air or water, um, uh, and some uh, laboratories have even uh, compared to a static pressure transducer for very low frequencies as well. Again, the idea here is the pressure is uniform at all points within the uh, coupler, 
uh, or chamber. Um, and you're, there's essentially no sound waves in there. You're just varying the, the pressure um, experienced by the two devices. Um, and this covers, depending on the fluid medium used, if it's air, it will go up to a few hundred hertz. If it's water, you can normally go to high hundreds of hertz, even a kilo, kilohertz, using these kinds of methods. Um, the, the way these have been implemented within MPL, um, for, there are a number of these coupler types and a number of different ways of exciting them. Um, uh, a piston or even a loudspeaker, although if you get into very low frequencies, the loudspeaker might leak sound or leak air um, through its cone, so you have to have a loudspeaker that's sort of sealed, um, if, if you like, can't just be an ordinary paper cone. The, the, the way, uh, the, the interesting aspect of this particular type of system is that rather than with the laser piston phone or the primary coupler reciprocity, you can make the chambers larger, able to be flexible to suit um, to suit couplers of different sizes. Was that me pressing something or? or? No, sorry, okay. Um, uh, uh, and therefore you can fit different kinds of devices in there, um, the sorts of devices that might be used in the field. So if you look at the picture um, in the top right, you can see a device which is uh, being calibrated. Um, and on the bottom left, you can see a device which is actually an entire recorder system, so it has a, um, a electronics and so forth associated with it, um, which enable you to um, uh, make recordings of the, of the sound. In fact, for many of the applications that um, uh, that we use, um, we go, um, uh, the, 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 uh, of measuring sound in the ocean, actually these. Autonomous recorders are the preferred method of doing the calibrations. And the results you see there, the, the one in yellow is, has got a result for a hydrophone going right down to a few hertz, which is um, an unamplified hydrophone. And the one with the roll off is the recording system, the autonomous recorder, which is a pre amplifier and, and, and a recording system, which has a deliberately built in low frequency roll off, as indeed do the hydrophones of the IMS system, although the roll off for the IMS is much lower in frequency than this. The, the, these sort of systems that are used in general purpose tend to have the roll off to avoid um, uh, introducing very high level uh, um, uh, um, signals um, caused by just motion in the water column of the hydrophone. As the hydrophone moves up and down in the water column, the change in static pressure leads to a, a very low frequency signal, which is very high in amplitude. So that's sometimes attenuated by a filter. And this, allow, this sort of method allows us to have different couplers of different sizes for different hydrophones. The uncertainty, the accuracy is worse than it would be for the primary standard, but it allows us lots more flexibility about what kind of hydrophones we can measure. The other aspect of doing these uh, transfers, if you like, of the primary standard out to real devices is that real devices might be used in the ocean and not at room temperature and not at zero depth. Often they're used at considerable depth, so the, the IMS hydrophone stations are of the order of 1,000 meters deep. Um, and you need to be able to transfer that calibration um, to, to, um, to a hydrophone that will be used at that particular depth and temperature. And of course, the deep ocean is, tends to be um, uh, colder, um, uh, the, uh, not at room temperature, if you like, certainly not at the room temperature in here. Um, so consequently, we need methods that are, will allow us to do that. Now, we've already seen that the coupler reciprocity method has the potential for calibrating reference devices um, as a function of different temperatures and depths, and, and, and um, you've seen this slide before. But um, uh, the other method we have at MPL for calibrating devices at, uh, as a function of depth is this pressurizable vessel, which is a much larger vessel, which normally is used for free field measurements, but in this project we've been trying to use it for much lower frequencies where we, again, we are co-locating, effectively co-locating two devices and simultaneously um, in, um, uh, in sonifying them. The difficulty we've had with this particular method uh, uh, implementation is that to get down to the very lowest frequencies, we need a source that can generate um, signals at a few hertz, which has been proving difficult. Really, we need a mechanical source. But, 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 but um, this is the, the method we intend to use for these very low frequencies below 100 hertz to allow us to uh, disseminate the, um, uh, the standards for, um, realized by the coupler. And just to show some examples of these hydrophones um, and how they behave with temperature and depth, these are a few hydrophones. On the left, you've got 
um, measurements at lowish frequencies. And on the right, you've actually got measurements at much higher frequencies made at kilohertz frequencies, free field measurements from Decorlum. And you can see how at different temperatures and at different depths, the device sensitivity can change dramatically. Um, this isn't true for all devices. So, so one of the uh, aspects of our project is that we, looked, we were looking at surveying the existing devices that are out there, looking for devices that are more stable uh, with temperature and depth, um, which are more suitable as a, uh, as a reference device, if you like. Um, uh, and um, there are devices like this one here, it's just one example, um, uh, which are much more stable with depth, as you can see from the plots there. And these are um, usually the simpler element designs. Some of the devices I showed earlier have quite clever designs of hydrophone element where the attempt was to make a very low Q, very unresonant device by destroying the resonance of the element, which is either a sphere or a, in that case was a cylinder, um, breaking it into rings with um, rubber um, washers and end caps um, to make it much more damped. But unfortunately, all of those materials vary their properties dramatically with temperature and depth. So consequently, they lead to device sensitivities which change with temperature and depth. Simple spherical devices like this one are often much more um, stable with depth. And, and those, those are the ones uh, which are much more suitable for use as a reference device. And there's an NPL report um, from the project looking at this particular aspect of the device performance. Just one final thing on that topic. Um, in order to determine whether the device is sensitive to temperature and depth, you can actually just look at the electrical impedance over that ver um, and variety of environmental conditions. The sensitivity of the device is also reflected in its electrical impedance, especially near resonance. And you can see, for example, this particular de designer devices. There are two very similar designs available on the market. This is high frequencies, admittedly, but you see how Measuring the electrical impedance can give you an idea of whether it's stable or not. So you don't have to do a full set of measurements at all temperatures and depths with a much more complicated and um, time-consuming um, facility such as the vessel I showed earlier. Um, so how are the, just out of interest, how are the CTPDO hydrophones calibrated? Well, those are calibrated um, by the US designated institute. So um, the NMIs in some countries have also associated institutes which are designated to hold the standards for particular applications, particular fields. And in the USA, it's um, the U, uh, Underwater Sound Reference Division um, in Newport, Rhode Island. And they, um, they have a couple of reciprocity facilities like the one I've shown. And they have these um, pressurizable tubes, uh, standing wave tubes, which they use to do the calibrations um, from a few hertz up to kilohertz using um, uh, either using them as a coupler uh, for the very lowest frequencies, or you can also use them to simulate either standing or traveling waves um, uh, with particular cutoff um, frequencies at high and low frequencies. Um, so, um, however, as I mentioned earlier, we haven't yet managed to have a worldwide comparison to make sure that there's an equivalence between these calibrations and those of all the other NMIs in the world. So that's something that once uh, after the infra-AV is over, we'll be able to actually um, conduct that exercise and make sure there's an equivalence between these standards that are um, being um, utilized here and all of the others throughout the world, making sure that we're comparing apples and apples and not apples and oranges. OK, I think that's the, uh, end, of the end of the presentation. So just to summarize again, um, we, we, need, um, we can do a comparison exercise in small couplers to, to disseminate the standards from the primary standard. We're still um, working at the moment in the project on using the, uh, the, the pressure vessel we have to disseminate standards for hydrophones as a function of depth and, and changes in temperature. And um, we hope that the results of the infra AV will feed into future uh, key comparisons, which will improve the overall metrology infrastructure for this particular area. And that's it. Okay. So thanks very much, Steve. So if you recall those original objectives for the project, so the first one was to develop these primary calibration methods, but then we're using those to address the third objective to try and characterize the sensors themselves at, at the conditions in which they're likely to be used. So, so through the calibrations, we're getting to that third objective as well. Um, are there any, did I, I can't remember, did I ask for questions for Steve? Did, 
Yes, I think I did. So, okay, <laughs> sorry. So let's move on then to our third technology and lo look at how secondary calibration for seismic sensors is handled. So, yeah, Paul, please. Yeah, so uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Jacob Winter. I work as the department manager of the Danish primary. Uh, closer, this is better. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Jacob Winter. I'm uh, a department manager of the Danish primary laboratory on acoustics. Um, I also work with the ISO standardization and uh, as a delegate in the CCIUB. Um, I've been asked to do a talk today, this project, on our laboratory calibration of seismometers at low frequencies by comparison. Now, just to mention, this is not originally a part of the project for different reasons, uh, but please allow me to try to talk you through why I believe this to be re relevant and um, also possibly related calibration of uh, seismic stations. Um, just for the background, my work uh, usually is to try to facilitate uh, reference standard measurements for different production and development and national inter international customers. Uh, we have our calibration measurement capability listed in the uh, key comparison database, uh, and we work with the fundamental quantity of volt and meters per second or meters per second square with, um, with acceleration. Um, usually this work, when you talk about low frequency, has to do with man-made large structures um, whereas within the infra UE project, all of a sudden we're talking about ground vibration more. Um, and my point with this would be, I mean, seismologists would know a lot about the propagation of, of waves in the surface or distribution as a ball in Earth. Um, Man-made structures usually can be described fairly simple with uh, one or more uh, spring mass systems um, for the, the mounted resonance frequency. Um, and this is just an example of, of what we in the laboratory usually see. Uh, we're talking about a, a total mass of five to 500 grams and sensitivity of one millivolt to maybe a thousand millivolts per meters per second square, um, different technologies. Um, and then one is introduced to something totally different. Um, and my initial considerations on the primary part um, higher mass introduced laboratory set up 15 kilos and kilovolts, not millivolts. Um, and then there's this extension of the frequency range needed from 100 millihertz to, to 10 millihertz. Um, and then one more thing would be the different influence on the equipment used for calibration and also during calibration um, influence on the equipment. So just all in all, that, all, all sorts of fun. Um, Thomas has made a, 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 a nice presentation on uh, an introduction to the primary method. Um, within ISO, there's this 1663 family standards of our vibration. And the dash 11 method three is what we use also. We, we use the very stable helium neon, and pr quite simply, we, we measure the, um, the displacement uh, relative to the wavelength of life, uh, sorry, wavelength of light. Um, and then a setup for a low frequency primary calibration in the lab would be a laser interferometer, seismic block damping, whatever background movement during calibration that would be, um, vibration exciter, seismic block, and then some kind of foundation that needs to be utilized in a good way. And then you see the, the, the green square, and that would be, uh, the part of this would be you need to have some kind of really good fixture and a mechanical transfer to the reflecting surface. And as I think Thomas mentioned, there should not be any relative motion between those two because that is um, a direct uncertainty contribution, definitely. So it's, it's the mechanics of a, a low frequency setup is, is critical and something that one tends to work with and continuously optimizing. So related the, the extension of frequency range to 10 millihertz, I, um, I immediately thought that some kind of coherent analysis could be needed. Um, put differently, 100 millihertz measurements is difficult. Uh, for instance, with our data, we would have a maximum uh, vibration level of 0 0.017 meters per second square. With 100 millivolts per meters per second square transducer, this is not a lot of output. If you put in a lot of different motions, possibly, uh, it's, it's just not um, easy. So. Uh, I was, we were thinking um, 
that if you have two or more transducers, you could impose the same um, uh, stimuli to this, and, and then you could uh, distinguish the signals in um, a noise floor and still um, uh, say you've characterized this as a set instead. So we made some experience on that. You, you would see here the setup with uh, two um, outputs from the transducers and the in-phase and quadrature output. Uh, you would see the mounting surface with the reflecting surface and the calibration fixture that we, we usually use. And you would also see there's not like a lot of room for seismometers this size. Um, but it turned out as expected. We found like the threshold for our systems. We could, with this specific killer transducer, 500 or 250 millivolts per meters per second square, fairly high quality uh, transducer, we could measure that down to 40 millihertz without doing anything. When applying uh, the COPA method, we could stretch that to 10 millihertz. Um, so yeah, it turned out as, as expected. You see the, the, uh, the auto spectrum and the multi-buffer we used and um, inflation and quarter outputs. Um, so that leaves me finally to the secondary calibration. Um, the dash 21 um, of the 1606 standards um, mentions two methods. There is the direct comparison, where you have a known reference and you can do your calibration directly um, and compared to that. And then there's the back to back by substitution. Uh, basically, back to back by substitution is that you have um, not necessarily a reference standard. Uh, quality, but a, a, a stable accelerometer. You put in your calibrated reference, you measure the transfer function, you store that as a reference spectrum, and then you put on your device on the test. You measure that transfer function, and with that in place, you can calculate and normalize with the calibration values of the reference. Um, this is how it's done. And yeah, but how on earth would you try to do the exact same thing with, with seismometers? And um, we could at least have a look at what. Um, what would be needed. Um, so first of all, you would need to have um, really, really good air bearing. You would not like to have vibration, distortion components uh, imposed from the movement as such. And then you would very much need to have your, your, your air slide clamped to some kind of metrology grade um, gray night because of flatness. Um, you would need to have a very rigid coupling of uh, this entire system uh, through the entire chain to the to the actuator part, and all of this is in fact, I would say, commercially available within reason, um, and that's for the horizontal part. The vertical part is a little bit the same. You do need to do weight compensation um, to make sure this, the, this, the exciter is exposed to the dynamic mass, and not the, the static also, and um, and I would say. You also have the luxury of, of looking into the material of the mounting surface if you want to uh, try to impose that as a kind of a similarity to the infield use. Uh, that might make sense. And then you can make sure you have your reference or working standard uh, fixed with a really good rigid coupling in a proper manner, uh, just directly under the mounting surface. Um, so a little bit of a careful conclusion, I would say uh, that the, the higher mass and, and sensitivity uh, of seismometers definitely needs more attention to implement in, in secondary calibration laboratories. Um, and, and different mechanical setup is also needed. Um, the low frequencies would, as I see it, be limited to the works we do at, at NMIs the, the, and, and the associated uncertainty. Um, and the higher frequency limit would be physics, the mass you would impose on that. Well, you can always find a larger exciter and, and a larger amplifier, but then that would have a higher moving mass, so um, yeah. Um, and there are still some unknown parameters for sure. The influence on curvature, even though it's not primary, then, it, but it, it doesn't mean it's not there. But all in all, it should be uh, quite a lot more reduce the influences from, from different phenomena as I see it. Um, and the NMIs needed, definitely needed to provide the reference standard uh, measurements for this. But if a secondary calibration laboratory could uh, provide one, two, three, four, five references for the stations to be exchanged during calibration at convenience and we wouldn't have downtime, um, maybe it would be possible to just quite simply do calibration of the, of the stations um, remotely. So um, 
ending with a little bit of a question mark, but um, yeah, thank you for listening. Thank you. So just before, do we have any questions for Jacob, Jacob? Um, could we load up the first presentation again after? Any, any questions? So uh, for seismometer testing, there's a method that's often used of setting up multiple seismometers to measure the same ground motion. And this is natural ground motion, not controlled ground, uh, not controlled motion. Mm. Uh, what, what do you think about that method? I, I think that's how it, it should naturally be done. The whole point would be to kind of uh, facilitate a, a really well calibrated unit that has been calibrated in a, in a good neutral calibration lab environment and put that as the known unit and expose that to something in field that resembles normal use. And, and then again, the point of rotating would, would mean no downtime. And it also does something else. It would definitely provide the safety of, uh, well, challenging the calibrations you, you would make from that. And also even dreaming in colors, trying to do comparison to other other stations. Um, so um, I don't know if that answers your question, but I, there, there is always the thing about laboratory work and how would that resemble the use in field. But I still believe that you, you simply just have values um, in a way to compare to the, to the station like that. I, I, I find it difficult to do differently, but still natural sources um, for, for, um, for calibrating the stations, yeah. I guess I was wondering if um, natural ground motion could be used in the laboratory, not, not only in the field. Yeah. There's not necessarily anything wrong related to the standards of, of, of doing that. There would, an, an amendment would be, doing, would be needed, but I'm, I, I cannot know if that would eventually end up being um, some kind of solution. I just know that my, my laboratory has just moved for, to the second floor <laughs> would probably be a little bit difficult, but there, I mean, there are natural movements there for sure. Yeah. Thank you. I would, I would like to comment on that as well. Um, we will hear tomorrow about uh, our results in, in on site calibration trials. Um, and this is certainly a method to get. Uh, some kind of traceability, but most probably the uncertainty will be much higher than what could be gained by controlled oscillations. And on the other hand, as far as I understood what, what we did, I'm looking around for Michaela. Ah, here, very, very close to me. Um, oh, it, it took weeks of signal gathering from natural signals to get the calibration done. Uh, so it's a more a long-term process, and I'm not sure whether you can satisfy customer needs uh, in the, on that time scale. Any other comments or further questions? A any questions on any of the topics? We, we have a bit of time now. Uh, we've recovered some of the time, thankfully. Um, so if, if there are any questions on anything that's been brought up this morning, um, now, now is a good time to raise those. So Thomas, I had a question because probably I missed the beginning of your talk. Um, in the labor, laser interferometry calibration, you have a 663 millimeter, uh, sorry, nanometer wavelength and you didn't discuss what happens if the movement of the system goes beyond that so that you have a aliasing of the um, movement. Yeah, sorry, that, that was something from an expert, uh, not thinking beyond the expert boundaries. Um, of, of course, you have movements that are much larger than this 633 nanometers. Um, but during the analysis, you, n you know that your system will not immediately stop and turn around. So you know that if you have a certain change in the light-dark pattern, um, that 
the, the movement is going either further in the one direction or it's reaching the turning point and going around. So there's a mathematical, quite a very, it, it sounds difficult, but it's a very simple algorithm that makes sure that you can, can track the whole motion. So if you have a, a, a long stroke motion, um, you have a, a signal on the photodiode that goes like this and then it gets slower and then it kind of turns around in polarity and goes again like this, but you know it's turning in the other direction. So the, it's a kind of a demodulation like you do it with the, with the radio transceiver um, in the end. So it's, you, can, you can measure arbitrary distances. And, and so typically how far is one cycle? <coughs> well, that actually depends depends very much on the frequency. Um, if we look at the seismometer calibration at 10 millihertz, we use that PDB for our experiments, um, one millimeter per second um, velocity amplitude. Um, and with a mixture of frequencies, we came up with 30 millimeters peak to peak, so three centimeters. That was the, and that's the largest displacement. If we look at our commercial calibrations, we usually do at 20 kilohertz, we are on a nanometer scale for the vibration amplitude. So it's, it's very, very different. And that's what I wanted to indicate. Even if we have nanometer amplitude, which is far below the wavelengths, um, we can still identify the full motion um, of the armature of this mov moving element. So, so just for Earth reference and not in a big earthquake where the ground movement is on the order of 7 or 20 meters, um, I saw a, a record of movement at Pasadena from the 2004 Sumatra earthquake, which was one centimeter. And I think we consider that a piggy, pretty big movement in normal, not local seismic measurements. That's also one thing that we have really to distinguish. Um, very many publications I saw about seismometer characterization are concerned with self-noise and how sensitive they are and, and at what level you can start to make sensible measurements. This is not what we are looking at. We are looking at the transfer function, the gain factor and, and, and the phase, and we have the luxury to choose a very nice signal to noise for this calibration. If we start to go further and look for linearity of the devices, then we also will go down in amplitude and also maybe a little bit more up in amplitude of the excitation and, and uh, look what the sensitivity change is over uh, these different amplitudes. But we actually, not, at least not yet, we do not care about the noise floor. That's not our, our business currently. Okay, thank you very much. I, I think um, we're, we're coming towards the end of our, the time we have available here. Um, so I, I thought just before we all leave today's session, just have a very brief look at what's coming up in the next part of this workshop. Um, so tomorrow morning, exactly the same time from 9 till 11.30, uh, we have part two of our agenda, so we've done this one today. So tomorrow we, we take the step, a, a, another further step in the chain into the field. So we're looking now at how all of the laboratory capabilities we've been looking at today, how all of those can be applied in the field and what the implications are for field measurements based on this laboratory capability that we're attempting to transfer there. Um, so again, we're looking at the three technologies. Um, so we'll start with infrasound and we'll look at um, some, some of the developments for field calibration for infrasound. Um, some of the new capabilities you get from having calibration traceability in the field. Um, and we'll look at some of the software tools that are available um, that the CTPTO have developed um, for, for analyzing field data. Um, we'll also look at some of the difficulties associated with field measurements in the ocean. Um, 
So you know, we'll, we'll look at some of the, the problems faced with trying to do the same kind of thing, but in the ocean. Um, and, and we'll also have a deep look at some of the seismic field calibration processes that, that go on. So hopefully tomorrow's session will be bringing the interest factor closest to, to some of the things that you, you guys are more likely to be concerned with. But thank you for indulging us today and allowing us to talk about these laboratory calibration applications that are closer to the metrologist's heart. Um, but tomorrow, I, I promise, we'll, we'll move more towards the field and, and maybe some, some more relevant um, topics for, for you to engage with. Um, so, so that's coming up tomorrow. Um, what I should say is that in the project, in this Infra AV project, we're running until now the end of December. And one of the goals we have in that project is to develop a guidance document, basically a document that's capturing all the new knowledge coming from the project, but how that knowledge can be applied for operating stations effectively, so how you bring the traceability to stations, trying to capture some of the best practices and so on. So um, that document will be ultimately available from the project website, so if you're interested in that, um, e either check out the website towards the end of the year. But if you wish, you can also register an interest to receive that directly by mail. So uh, please do have a look at the project website. There are various, um, there are links on some of the posters at the back of the room. Uh, you should find a QR code somewhere where you can um, capture the website link in, in your phone or something. Um, but yeah, there will certainly be a guidance document. There are also several scientific and technical presentations, publications uh, emerging from the project. And again, all, all of those are listed on the website. So if there's a topic you're particularly interested in, um, you can find the publication. You can contact the authors quite easily through, again, the contact details found on the website. Um, yeah, so any member of the project team can be contacted via, via the contact point on the website, and we're always happy to engage in email discussions uh, down the line after this event has finished and so on. Um, so, so please do keep in touch if there are things relevant to, to your work. Um, with that, I will close the session today. Um, I think there are another presentation session starting in here at 11.30, so... Um, uh, I guess we, we won't have that much time to linger and chat, but we will be available outside if, if you wish.